Thank you. All right, so P is our 41%, and we're choosing seven women. So what, what can we label seven with? N, that's our trials. Each lady that we ask is our trial. And like I said, this is pretty consistent. So that's why I think on our calculator, they ask for N and P first, because you're always asking the same amount and the probability is always the same. How many say yes, that's gonna differ, okay? So part A, find the probability that at least five of them have reading as a favorite hobby. And this is kind of interesting because we see that word at least, but it's not at least one, it's at least five. So that is P, of x being greater than or equal to five, like that. That's our inequality that we're gonna to try to find out. Well, at least five means five say yes, I like reading, or six say yes, I like reading, or seven say yes. Do I need to go past seven? Why not, because I only asked seven. So do you guys agree that at least five out of seven would be just the probability of x equaling five plus the probability of x equaling six plus the probability of x equaling seven. Is that okay? So at least five is a little bit different than that at least one problem that we did before, right? Because at least one was everyone else. At least five is just five and on, okay? If you guys are okay with it, I'm not gonna worry about setting up the formula. We can talk about it. So this would always be seven, and then the x's would differ. And first it'd be five, and then it would be six, and it'd be seven, right? but your P would always be 41, and your one minus P would always be 59. And we could do that three times and add them all up. Um, I don't think you can do it three times. I say that, I don't know, you can try it. I don't, I don't know if you can do it three times on the binomial PDF, so we might have to do it one at a time, but let's just see. So we're gonna go to second vars, and we're gonna scroll down to binomial PDF, and we're gonna do it for five first. Okay, my calculator is gonna die, I know. Please let me do it. All right, so you go down to binomial PDF and you choose it. And how many total women are we asking? Seven. What's the probability they say reading's their favorite um, hobby? 41. And how many women are we worried about saying yes initially? Five. So round that to like five decimals. 0 0.08469. Cuz, did you get that? Is that okay, Jake? So we asked seven women total. The chance that they say reading is their favorite hobby is 41%, and I'm worried about five ladies. And so whatever you have to round to, so like say the end we have to round to four, and our intermittent part, round to five. Like always have an extra one while you're doing your math, and at the end we'll round at the very end. I believe I've tried to do plus, plus, plus before, and it doesn't work. But what's nice is, especially both old and new calculators, if we hit second um, enter, if you hit second enter, it brings back that screen you just had. And what's the only thing we have to change? The last number, the last number right? Because we're still asking seven ladies. The probability is still 41%. But now instead of five of them saying they like reading, what do we care about? Six. So we can just go type over our five and make it a six. And round that to five decimals, you'll get 0 0.01962. Does that look okay? And then last one, one more time, guys, hit second entry again, or second enter. Second enter, and the same screen will pop up. And what do we have to change our six to now? A seven. And that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So we have 0 0.00195, okay? So we know if we were just doing this individually, five of the seven, we have about eight and a half percent that five out of the seven would do it. But these get smaller because if 41% like reading, and all seven ladies say, yeah, I like reading, it's very slim. So that's why they kind of get lower. Add those three numbers up. What do you get? 0 0.08469 plus 0 0.01962 plus 0 0.00195. Do you get 0 0.10626? Does that look okay? And by adding that fifth decimal, we will get the rounding correct. And what do I mean by that? If they tell us to round to four decimals, we'll say that this is 0 0.1063 or 10.63%. Does that look right? Is that what you guys got? If you round too soon up there, um, that might be off by a little bit. I think my math lab has gotten better each year about um, it's called like a tolerance. I don't know if you've seen it before. If you 
get it wrong and you hover over it, it has like plus or minus 0 0.001 or something like that. Did you guys notice that in your probability section at all? You know what I'm talking about? For the homework answers. Um, so I think they're pretty good about having a tolerance because if you rounded these to four and added them, I think you get like 1062 even. So they should take 1063 or 1062. All right, so at least five, you just have to stop and think, okay, if I'm asking seven, at least five would be five and more. So five, six, and seven. What's nice is we can just change that last number and quickly calculate those second and third probabilities. All right, the next one, this is not as fun. Um, well, it's not, I shouldn't say not as fun. It's about the same, but it's um, a little bit in between. It says, find the probability that the number of women who have reading as their favorite hobby is between three and five inclusive. So that means X is between three and five. Inclusive means it could be three, it could be five, right? So how is that going to play out? That's the same thing as the probability of X being three of the women having it as their favorite hobby, plus the probability of X four of them, plus the probability of X being five. So it's kind of the same thought process where we don't use the word exactly. If it said exactly, that's when you only find that one probability and you're done. But if they have the words at least or inclusive, you know that you're going to be doing it multiple times, all right? What's nice in this, I use the word nice when you want it, is this last one here. We've already calculated it up here, right? So I'm going to just write him down here already so I know that I don't have to do him. And then that leaves me room to write the other two, okay? I still can just do that um, second enter or whatever. So I'm going to go to my probabilities again. So second VARS, and I'm going to scroll to binomial PDF. Mine's going to die every time, sorry. Um, second VARS, and I'm going to scroll to binomial PDF. And we're still asking seven, mine's not going to let me do it. We're still asking seven women, so your N's still seven, guys. The probability of them saying they like reading is still 41%, so your P is still 41. But now I'm worried about three of those ladies saying they have reading as their favorite hobby. Round it to five decimals, what do you get? Two nine two. Anybody? Like that. Two nine two three three. Does that look right? I don't think so. Okay. Three zero. Three zero. Because you said there was a nine. Okay. Does that look right? Guys, go ahead and hit second enter and have that pop up again, but change your last value of three to a four. How many, what's the percent that four ladies have reading as their favorite hobby? What's that one? 0.203, one, two, like that? Okay, so we'll add those three up. I don't know if my calculator will even let me do that. 0.2923 plus 0.20312 plus 0.0846. Do you get 58,011 or 0.5801 or 58.01%? The reason why this one's a little bit higher, 41%, guys, is kind of in the middle. So you'd expect about the middle of seven to say, yes, reading's my favorite hobby. And that's kind of where we're looking at, the three, four, and five range. So our odds are a little bit higher. Um, before you flip it, I was going to tell you one more thing, and sometimes I hesitate to do it, but there's one on your, just only one on your homework where you, you're going to want to know this trick, and it's on part A, okay? So part A, we had at least five, right? So we're doing like five, six, seven, we're counting up. On your calculator, you know every time we go to binomial PDF, you guys see binomial CDF right below it? CDF stands for cumulative. So what the CDF feature does, guys, it starts at X being zero and counts its way up to one, two, three, four, five, or wherever you want it to stop. So one way, you know how at least five was, at, that word at least was always the complement rule? I'm gonna write this on here and see if it makes sense to you. So I'm gonna write a big or. You do not have to do this, but there's one on your calculator that, or one on your homework that you might want to. You can still do it this long way, but it's just a lot of calculations. The probability of X being greater than or equal to five is the complement of one minus the probability of X being strictly less than five. Do you guys agree that five and higher is the opposite of four and lower? 
You guys see what I'm doing there? Or actually, let's do it right. Let's write it this way. Less than or equal to 4. I think that makes more sense. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because the CDF feature starts at the bottom and counts its way up, but we don't have a feature that has, you know, like we're looking at the top. We're looking at 5, 6, and 7, and we don't have a feature in our calculator that shows the top. We just have a feature in our calculator that has the lower end, okay? So in our calculator, guys, this is the same thing as 1 minus binome CDF with n being 7, 0.41 being our p, and then 4 being the opposite of 5 or more. Do that in your calculator. Um, I don't know if I'll let you do the 1 minus. I think you have to do the CDF feature first and then subtract it from 1. I'm blocking what I wrote, I'm sorry. So I'm gonna do a second variables. I'm gonna go to CDF real quick. It's not gonna let me do it. Um, go ahead and choose CDF. So figure out what the CDF feature is. You want to go up to and include 4, okay, because the opposite of 5 and more is 4 and below. And you'll get that number, but when you subtract that number from 1, it should be 1063. And again, adding 3 up was not bad, but I think you have one on your homework that's like 16 flights or something like that. What's the probability at least 2 of those 16 flights? And you have to add 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 16. So this feature is a little bit better. Does anybody get um, an answer for the CDF? Is it the complement of 1063 when you do it? Sorry. I always, I'm like such a cheapskate, so I never want to change my batteries <coughs> until my, my calculator dies. And he's still trying to live, but I just killed him. So now he's back to life. Okay. So you guys probably are like 18 steps ahead of me. Oh, maybe not. All right, you guys get it. <laughs> I'll show you on um, Wednesday, or if we get to the computer lab, I'll show you on um, the computer lab as well. I'm just making sure I put all those in correctly. I think one's upside down. All right, let's go ahead and flip it over. So one last concept is on Wednesday, guys, we had learned how to calculate means and standard deviations using a chart. But the binomial is a special type of distribution, so it has its own mean and standard deviation as well, okay? These are the formulas. These are probably the only two formulas that you'll have to use in chapter six, okay? Because six one was just the chart, and then the first part of six two is your calculator. So this is where we'll refer to it. It says a mean or expected value in the standard deviation of a binomial random variable. A binomial experiment with n independent trials and a probability of success p has a mean and standard deviation given by these formulas. The mean is simply taking your number of trials times your probability. Guys, that should make sense, right? If I'm shooting 10 free throws and I'm an 80% free throw shooter, how many free throws should I make? I'm an 80% free throw shooter and I'm shooting 10 free throws. I should make 80% of 10. What's 80% of 10? 8. And that's all they're doing. They're just saying, take your n, how many times you're doing this, times your probability of a success. Standard deviation is a little bit of work. You do n times p times 1 minus p, but it's all under the, the square root, and you just use your calculator. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. It says, on a multiple choice quiz, there are 10 questions with 5 possible outcomes, um, answers each meaning you have a 20% chance, it should be chance, not change, chance of choosing the correct answer. Assume we have not been in class for the past few weeks and have to guess for each question. What's the expected number of correct answers and standard deviation you would get on this test, okay? So the mean, guys, is just n times p. What is n in this case? 10, because there's 10 questions on the test, times P, what's our probability of getting a question right? 0 0.20, right? Or one fifth. So if you really are completely guessing on this quiz, how many questions should you guys get right? Two questions. So that says come to class, don't guess. Come to class, know something, right? So that's your expected. So whenever you see the expected number, remember that's another way of <coughs> asking what is the mean, okay? We took our number of questions 10 times our probability of getting a question right, 20%, and we got our expected value. 
Your standard deviation, guys, is we're just going to fill in this formula. We're going to take N, which was 10 questions, times P, which was 20%, times 1 minus P, well, if you have a 20% chance of getting a question right, what's the percent chance that you get it wrong? 80. 80. And you can do that all under your square root, okay? So those that have the newer calculators, it's nice because you type and it, your square root just keeps extending. Us that have our older ones, we'll just make sure that we have parenthesis 10 times 0.2 times 0.8 and then close off our parenthesis. And you get all that and you should have the answer. Let's round to two decimals. So this is how I do it with my old one. I do the square root of 10 times 0 0.20 times 0 0.80 like that, and I just close it off. 1.26, does that look right, guys? What does that mean? It means um, standard deviation, remember, is your distance from the mean. So if you're supposed to get two questions or right, give or take a question or so in either direction, right? So you might only make one or you might um, get three right. All right, last thing real quick, and I know there's a little fill in the blank, so I don't want to miss it, is they're just kind of showing you how if your probability is less than a half, you would, most of your stuff would be over here on this left side, so it's skewed right. Okay, that's all they're just showing you. You can kind of have an idea of what the graph looks like. Go ahead and flip it to the top of page 8. If your probability is exactly a half, you would expect most of your things to be right in the middle, so you have this beautiful bell-shaped or symmetric curve. And then vice versa, if you have a P, you would expect to make a majority of your free throws, right? So most of your stuff should be over here, so it's slightly skewed left. So it's just kind of letting you know you have an idea of what your distribution looks like. Because we don't ever actually see it. We just plug and chug, and we don't really have an idea of what we're doing. So say this is a free throw shooter, and you're an 80% free throw shooter. This is where a majority of your, your makes are going to be, and then you're not going to hopefully miss, you know, make only 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Another thing that I wanted to show you real quickly, guys, is that as your n gets bigger and bigger, so notice all these, I know it's kind of hard to see, but all these have a p of 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, so initially it kind of starts off skewed right. As your n gets bigger and bigger, 10, 30, 70, as your n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it starts to become more bell-shaped, and that's just the underlying theme of staff. The more and more you do, the more accurate you're going to be kind of idea. So the last thing I always forget to fill in the blank here is don't forget about the empirical rule. Remember the empirical rule was this bell-shaped curve, and 95% of our data lives, lies within two standard deviations. So that was mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma. Um, there's one on your homework where it asks you, okay, what are the cutoffs for your 95%? Well, you had already calculated mu, and you already calculated sigma, so all you're going to do is do 2 times sigma and subtract it from your mean, and 2 plus times sigma and add it to your mean, and you're going to get that range. When you get there, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so what we're